And away we go. Hi, everybody. So welcome. Uh, first Saturday with Dr. Keith, uh, maintaining sanity in post-truth world. The um, way it works is um, if you want to ask a question, you can click Q&A and write down a question. Um, and um, I'll get to it at the question mark, question uh, period. Um, if you uh, have a, um, want to come on live and, and have a dialogue of after I talk for about 15 or 20 minutes, that's great. You just raise your hand. And when you raise your hand, you unmute. Um, it's the lower left. Uh, there'll be a mute button and you, or upper left, I guess, um, on your screen. And um, just click unmute when we're talking and then click mute again when we're done. I'm going to talk for a little while and then um, make a few announcements. And then um, we will have Q&A. And you can write down a question anytime while I'm talking. So, and, but then, uh, and then I'll get to it if we have time. And um, you can raise your hand if uh, you want to go live with me. So first of all, hi, everybody. Good to see you. Um, uh, and I wanted to, to kind of frame this in a particular kind of way. Um, I'm a psychotherapist. I'm an integrally informed psychotherapist. And what we want to do as integrally informed psychotherapists is we want to heal the world. We want to heal the world one session at a time, one person at a time, one couple, family, group at a time. And during the last year, a lot of sessions, as you might imagine, have um, involved uh, the election. Um, it was a shock. People grieved. I did a lot of grief work um, with uh, people and with myself. And my clients were pissed. They, they were shocked and they were pissed. A lot of the women I worked with threw up the night of the election. It was just too overwhelming. And they threw up because they're smart. They knew that a lot of damage would happen and a lot of death would happen. And, um, and it has. But they were stuck with it. Uh, and that's part of being the same person. Same people are responsible for everything they experience and do. So if a drunk driver runs a light, runs into your car and breaks both your legs, now you're responsible for healing your legs. Now you can of course sit there and get pissed off at a culture that allows drunk drivers or get pissed off at the drunk driver or get pissed off for having broken legs. Bottom line is you gotta deal with your broken legs. So say we have to deal now with these injuries to our society. And so when my clients get pissed off, I join them for a little bit, you know, and we explore it and so on. But then we try to go deeper. And what I've discovered over the last year is that, that outrage needs to be a threshold. Um, and if you don't use it as a threshold, a step into deeper understanding, then you risk becoming part of the problem. And so I want to go a little bit deeper into that because in therapy, um, motive discourse is the bottom line. Motive discourse is way more important than content. And it's especially useful to, to distinguish between argument, debate, and dialectic. So an argument is you and I are going back and forth, and I'm pissed off at you, you're pissed off at me, and I want to change your opinion, don't want to receive your opinion, and it gets personal after a while. Okay, that creates a lot of energy, nothing happens. A debate is I'm trying to convince you and resist you convincing me. Not much happens. And if it's at a dinner party, you and I might be having a good time. Everybody else is being miserable. A dialectic is we're going back and forth looking for deeper truth, open to influence from each other. Most psychotherapy involves dialectics. And so that mode of discourse is a really big deal because the current culture pulls us in the argument it pulls us into cynicism and it pulls us into debate. And if we don't notice that we've shifted mode of discourse, we can't go back towards the dialectic. And the dialectic isn't the only form of discourse. It's also relating and handling. I'll talk about that later. But I think it's important to recognize that, that when you're aware of mode of discourse, that you are responsible to choose a mode that is the most productive mode, choose a mode that serves the highest good. Now, along all this, Ken's monograph on Trump in the post-truth uh, world has really helped me a lot because he's related to all this mess as uh, 
an evolutionary um, correction. And I agree with that. I think this is an evolutionary uh, uh, correction. Um, and uh, as, it, as it occurs, it highlights an awful lot of things that we care deeply about. Things that we didn't really have to pay as much attention uh, to under Obama. And it, and it puts pressure on us who are the progressives, it puts pressure on the people that have the deepest consciousness to make a difference in some sense. You know, and so how do we make differences? Well, one is paying attention to uh, mode of discourse. Another is looking at the personal and the cultural up-levelings that we want to support. Now, the cultural up-levelings we want to support are a lot of the political positions that are very much like Bernie and Hillary's platforms and that social democracies around the world have demonstrated that from all four quadrants that it works and it's profitable to support children, families, education, healthcare, thriving middle class, that kind of stuff. Most of us support that. Um, um, most of us feel like that's important. Um, most of us progressives. Um, but a lot of the other up levelings involve are personal. They involve waking up and cleaning up. And we have challenges to wake up and clean up to go deeper and cleaner as we deal with the mess. Because communication is complementary. When you have anger coming to towards you, vitriol coming towards you, and polarized positions coming towards you, yourself, your unconscious self, your shadow self, is going to want to respond in kind because communication tends to be complementary. And it requires some effort to not respond in kind. And so one thing to recognize is responsible for everything we experience and do. So a lot of uh, my work when I'm talking about what's been going on is when people are complaining about the new world, world order, I go into the drunk driver breaking your legs metaphor. We are responsible for um, the new world order. And it's crying out to us for deeper understanding. And in therapy, um, this highlights some aspects of therapy that a lot of people don't know. Therapy is never value free. They talk about therapists being judgmental, but non judgmental, which is true. Therapists are accepting, but they have values. Just as I take stands against abuse, neglect, and emotional and physical violence, I also take stands for deeper understanding, for healing, for wisdom, for dialectics instead of arguments. And there's some principles that have emerged in the last eight or nine months that I find particularly useful. Um, and the first one is expand compassionate understanding. Expanding compassionate understanding is understanding everybody, including the other side, and that includes the reactionary right. And part of it is understanding that they have tactical advantages. And the tactical advantages come from the value memes that they operate out of. Practically, over the last 30 years, it's apparent that in public discourse, people who care purely about effects and are indifferent to facts and being found out as liars have huge political advantages. This is a natural strength for gaining power in a democracy for unhealthy red, amber, and orange, which are Trump's base. Similarly, Republicans have been winning the branding wars for decades. They successfully branded the whole Congress as obstructionists as they created obstructionism, and they branded liberals as weak and fuzzy headed to the extent that liberals had to rebrand themselves as progressives. They redefined government protecting and taking care of people as creating entitlements and being a nanny state rather than doing what democratic governments are meant to do, which is take care of people. And during the election, Trump kept branding his opponents with impunity and huge effects, often with obvious projections to us, but not to everybody else, like Colin Hillary Cricket. Well, you know, who's a cricket person? Um, this is an effective tactic that can't be used by uh, Green and Teal. We have to find other tactics, because if we have beautiful, good, and true values, we can't, we can't do that. And also, you never beat people at their own game. So that's one principle that's emerged. You just got to honor the fact that there are uh, tactical advantages that the other side has, and we have to look for our tactical advantages. And in terms of sides, we're really not talking about uh, the us and the them. We're talking about a big we that has a schism in it, and I'm taking a stand for us being more of a we again. And part of that is looking for my own destructive shadow in angry or frightened attitudes and impulses. And so just think about it. 
right now, is there somebody that you're pissed off at in the public discourse? Okay, everybody has somebody they're pissed off at, you know, particularly people in power. So what kind of judgments do you have about them? Are they a bad person? Are they evil? Are they selfish? Are they narrow-minded? You know, are they a bigot? You know, what is it? And, you know, and really, what do you want to do with them? Mostly, when we find somebody that we experience is dangerous, we want to constrain them. Um, we want to protect ourselves and the collective from them. We want to control them. Um, and that's when we're pissed off and frightened, that's what we want to do. Okay. Now, we have similar forces in us that they have. You know, they want to change the culture around what they believe or is consistent with their values. We want to change the culture around what's consistent with our values. Um, reactionaries tend to reduce other people to black and white concrete operational good, bad terms. Okay, I have tendencies in me to reduce people to black and white concrete operational black and white good, uh, good bad terms. I don't want to do that. I want to understand people in a more deep fashion. I want to understand their values. Um, expressing outrage doesn't create bridges between factions. You know, Amber is fine with double standards. Um, you know, Trump is indifferent to being caught in lies. They're just alternative facts and accuses opponents of lying. That's fake news. I mean, oblivious to projections because I mean, the projections aren't really visible until you get into orange. And, you know, and that's true for a lot of people. And so one thing that I can do is I can go, okay, since I can see that stuff and some other people can't, I need to take a stand for dialectic. So when someone comes in and they're all pissed off about something, I go, well, let's you and I have a dialectic about it. Let's find something deeper. Let's find some deeper understanding. You know, the, the new education secretary that Corey made, made the, the DeVos said, is that, <laughs> she, I'm DeVos, she's DeVos. <laughs> um, she has values. She thinks charter schools are great. You know, she wants to support them. Okay. Okay, so understanding that she's coming from a principled position is useful for me. Now, this all plays back into the whole realm of argument, debate, and dialectic. I was working with a couple last week, and they were beginning an argument. You know, they were getting critical of each other in the midst of disagreeing. And I interrupted them and redirected them into a dialectic. And I said, excuse me for interrupting, but I got to interrupt argument. And I said, if I had a dime, if I had a dime for every time I've interrupted um, an argument in my office over the last 44 years, I could buy the local bistro. Um, and they laughed. They really got it. Okay. Um, mode of discourse matters. So one, I want to look for deeper understanding. Two, I want to look for my own shadow and my anger and my outrage. Now, what are the parts of me that I need to regulate into from competition or from attack into cooperation and deeper understanding into right action. And this is, by the way, really following a lot of, the, of, the, of Ken's um, new writing. That's not actually new, but he's emphasizing it about integral being about enfoldment and non-exclusion. Okay, non-exclusion is where well, I don't exclude anybody. Enfoldment is I look for ways to find some kind of shared platform and then enactment, looking for some kind of shared um, action. Now let's talk about this on a very personal level. A lot of people avoid political conversations with good reason. It doesn't go anywhere. But say that happens, okay, and you somebody is inviting you into an argument or a debate. So you can invite them into a dialectic, but what if they don't want to have a dialectic? Okay, so then you can't relate with them at that point. You need to handle them. And by handling, I'm not talking about being dismissive and so on. I'm talking about the person with the deepest consciousness in the room has the most responsibility in the room. And so the way that you handle someone who is insisting on debate or argument is you look for some kind of shared value and you sign on for that. Some kind of shared action that you can do with this person and you sign on. You know, do you want to help? You know, there's an organization called Doctors Without Walls in Santa Barbara. It's got conservative and liberal people. They take uh, health care to homeless people. And they think it's a good idea because it saves money for the hospitals and so on. And it saves lives. Find something like that and you share it with someone. Okay. And there's always something. Educating your kids. Providing resources for your town. Supporting your police department or your fire, fire department. That kind of stuff. Okay. Making that kind of shift in the dialogue with someone who can't relate is handling somebody. Okay, and that's fine. 
You know, if you want to handle someone, handle them and handle them in a direction. And what's the direction we want to go? We want to go to making good things happen. And here's another problem that's happened in, since the election. People are let, allowing their distress about the way things are to interfere with them having happy lives. My wife, Becky's spiritual teacher, Gual Kuhl, um, told one of their classes once, the purpose of life is to be happy. And I agree with that. Now, you know, happiness is very complicated. It involves a lot of things, including service. But we need to stay focused on that. We have a responsibility to ourselves and the people that love us and that we love to do the things that help us be happy. And what are the keys to that? What are the keys to having a happy life? Well, one, enjoying life is important. You know, loving ourselves and other people better is important and serving the world. So what are some clues around that? Well, enjoying life means having an optimistic explanatory style. For instance, I think the progressives always win. That helps me deal with some of the current excesses that get, keep happening day in and day out. Um, and Ken said once, if you step back far enough, um, you get a positive view. And I think that's true. You know, Jeff and I and Shrink and Pundit, we, we, Jeff makes this point again and again and again. If you look at human history, you see a lot of regressions, but mostly you see us moving towards more compassion, towards deeper consciousness. And we can enjoy life practicing what attitudes that we have. I teach heart math, for instance, almost every day of my professional life. Heart math is pretty straightforward. You focus on gratitude or joy or love in your heart, thinking of someone, and you maintain that affect as a, as a yoga, as a practice. Loving kindness meditation makes us happy. And also, it helps resolve schism. So let's do a little exercise with loving kindness meditation. Think about someone you love right now. And just extend your heart to their heart, wherever they are. And as you do this, I want you to say to them in your mind, may you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you have an easeful life. Just be aware how you feel as you send that from your heart to their heart. I feel good when I do this. I'm sending this to you, to listeners now. I'm sending from my heart to your hearts. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you have easeful lives. Okay, let's do it. Make it harder. Let's think of somebody in the administration that you're pissed off at. Trump's too easy. Find somebody else. Okay. Whoever it is. You know, maybe there's Secretary of State, you know, maybe DeVos, who, who knows? Direct your heart to their heart and say to them, may you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you have an easeful life. Loving kindness meditation. Loving kindness meditation, meditation helps ease us and, and, and ground us in what we're about. And relationships are important about being happy. You know, a lot of couples have spontaneously come to the understanding that either one of them, either one of them at any time can say, I don't want to talk about Trump anymore. And the other one says, of course, I'll stop right now. Okay. Why is this? Well, one, nobody likes to listen to rants. I know that from personal experience that my family won't let me go more than three seconds into a rant until they tell me to shut up. Um, that's one of the reasons I did my therapist in the wild, uh, web series, I want to be able to do rants and get away with it. <laughs> and I still do once in a while, okay? Relationships. You know, we want to maintain our relationships with ourselves, with other people, and that means focusing on all the stages of self-love, which I've talked about elsewhere, and I'll mention briefly here, and the stages of loving other people. And, you know, humans, were very, very complicated. We are conceived and we are loved. We're born and, we're, and we are loved. Um, we become small children, we're loved conditionally, and we come into a theory of mind and we love ourselves conditionally. And it's only through depth and practices and deep understanding and deep inquiry that can we go back to we are love. Um, and we do it through wisdom rather than through innocence. And we do the same thing in terms of organizing our relationships as we proceed on the integration of defenses line of development learn how to not project our darkness on the other people, learn how to create good inner subjectivity and shift into a lady in dialectics, shift away from arguments, shift away from shadowy defensive material, recognizing that in ourselves and other people. Okay, well, that makes for great relationships. And I've talked a lot about that in my Loving Completely course on Integral Life, which I'm turning into a book. 
And of course, there's serving the world. Serving the world is giving our best gifts. You know, there's, there's an ancient Chinese saying that says about happiness. It says, if you want to be happy for an hour, take a nap. If you want to be happy for a day, go fishing. If you want to be happy for a month, get married. If you want to be happy for a year, inherit a fortune. If you want to be happy for a lifetime, serve others. And that's the yoga that we're all called to do. We're all called to serve others. And so part of my challenge throughout this whole time has been to help people process the new order, to find their purpose in it. You know, how can I help uh, make things better? And to continue on the, the process of having a happy life. You know, being joyful, loving myself and others better and serving the world. Now, all that being said, does anybody have any comments they'd like to make or any questions that they would like to ask? And then remember, if you, wanna, if you want to um, ask a question, just raise your hand. And if you want to write in a question, you can click the Q&A and you can write in a question. So anybody want to raise their hand? Let's see. Okay. Attendees. Anybody want? Yes. Uh, while we wait, Keith, for uh, someone to ask a question, um, I just wanted to mention, you know, you have uh, a practice on trauma that Integral Life is going to be producing uh, sometime in the next few weeks. And I believe it's a practice that you created uh, with the intention of focusing on, on individuals' trauma. But it occurs to me that right now, uh, nationally, we're sort of sharing some collective trauma. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any advice, uh, you know, how, how, can we, how can we help each other to process and metabolize uh, sort of, you know, the, the massive amount of outrage that we see, which is, you know, sort of taking its toll and I think, you know, leaving a lot of people feeling a little frayed around the edges. The nature of trauma is that um, it um, disorients and dysregulates the natural information processing uh, processes that we have in us. You know, our, our unconscious, our collective unconscious, our adaptive unconscious, our shadow self is pretty good about processing the world. But you know, nobody gets through childhood, nobody gets into life unscathed. We all have injuries, we all have sensitivities, and we all have defensive states that we're prone to. And a defensive state is if our nervous system reads the world is unsafe, it goes into a defensive position where it has, we have amplified or numb uh, emotions, distorted perspectives, destructive impulses, and decreased capacities for empathy and self-reflection. And people um, in arguments, almost by definition, are in defensive states. And defensive states are based in subjective trauma of our life where we weren't attuned to properly, we were neglected, or we experienced ourselves as being abused or we were abused. So something happens like the election. Okay, Trump basically is a red bully in a lot of ways. All of us were bullied by somebody. And so he does a bullying maneuver and we feel a flood of rage. Well, that flood of rage is, of course, righteous indignation against the bully. But... If it was on a one to 10 scale, maybe the flood of rage that is proportionate to deal with Trump is four or five, and I might be feeling a nine. My job is to notice that extra energy and go, okay, Keith, where's that extra energy coming from? You know, and that extra energy comes from the times in my life where I was bullied by other people, and I wasn't able to successfully protect myself. I wasn't able to carry through the subjective sense of triumph or self-identity. It's just noticing that and being aware that I'm adding that extra baggage reduces the trauma just a little bit. Just noticing I'm entering a distorted state, a defensive state, just noticing and saying, wow, I'm in a defensive state. That often will regulate you out of a defensive state into a state of healthy response where my nervous system says, okay, now I'm socially engaged again, I'm safe. I have access to empathy. I have access to self-reflection. Um, I have access to wisdom. Defensive states block our wisdom because they want immediate action, immediate defensive action. And that's why one of the reasons that you see Trump make these impulsive things all the time, he enters defensive states easily. He's easily threatened as most bullies are. And then lashes out defensively without much thought. 
Uh, well, the way that tells me is he spends an awful lot of his life in defensive states, and he's going to be regulated by the government and by the courts and all that other stuff as long as he's in power around that. But what his defensive states do with us is they cause us to have complementary defensive states. Mm -hmm. We want to protect by attacking. We want to protect, by, you know, fight, flight. Now, a good way to understand this is what do you do when you have your six-year-old enter a defensive state? Okay, well, the bad thing to do is to try to out-bully your little kid if the kid's trying to bully you. Okay, bad <laughs> idea. Okay, that's just, a, you know, just great. Child abuse. <laughs> bad idea. Another bad idea is to neglect your kid. You know, you know they're, they're throwing a temper tantrum in the car and you just say, okay, I stopped at the gas station, let him out and drive away. I've had people do that to their kids, as a matter of fact. And it's, it turns into a lifelong trauma. <laughs> no, so you don't do that. Okay, what you do is you contain them. You handle them. You go, okay, this guy, now I have to handle the, the president. We didn't have to handle Obama. Obama was taking care of all of us. And we got used to it. A lot of people got too used to it, I think. You know, we all normalized that basic attribution theory and didn't realize how good it was. That, you know, the guy at the top, I mean, you're not a perfect guy, but the guy at the top is someone that, that I trusted with stuff a lot more than I trust, I trust myself. I trusted Obama to make almost any government decision better than Keith could make a government decision. And I don't trust Trump to make any government decision as well as, I don't know, a normal, intelligent 12-year-old would make a government decision. Okay, so it's a lot scary. So that extra energy, noticing it, noticing my own defensive state, and then reaching for compassionate understanding. Okay, now that regulates the trauma with him, and that regulates the stimulation. But also, if I'm remembering you know, a time when I was bullied by somebody and I still feel a little flood of, flood of rage, I can address that. I can work with that. And there's a lot of ways of working with that. One way is just recognizing it and going from that to the present moment where I'm safe and then going back and back going back to the present moment where I'm safe, feeling a part of my body that feels weak when I remember the bullying and say in my, in my solar plexus, and then going to a part of my body that feels strong, my feet and legs feel strong, going back and forth. That's Peter Levine's technique, somatic uh, reintegration. And just working with it until when I remember that event, I don't just feel that surge of distress. Mm. Okay. And what that means is that I've activated the adaptive information processing um, modes, neurobiological system, and it's processed that, that, that trauma to a place where it, be held, where it should be held as part of my narrative of my life, as part of my autobiographical narrative that helps understand the epic journey and the epic journeys in uh, my life. And we all have, we're all at the center of the hero's journey, all of us. And that journey has a lot of monsters in it, has a lot of trauma in it, and every once in a while we have to go back and take care of it, and every once in a while some current distress stimulates an old trauma. And so those are some ways of dealing with it and, and of understanding it. And it's one of the reasons, one of the reasons the, there was a women's march, those women had been traumatized by men throughout their life. And so having him be elected just re-stimulated that trauma. Right. Um, and so I have to do something, I have to do something. Go do the women's march, yes. Knit pussy hats, hats. yes. I, I had a friend who was doing a group once and she had the men and women divide up. And she said, I want all the men to remember a time they were traumatized by a women, woman, and all the women to remember a time they were traumatized by a man. We're going to come back and talk about it. So I came back and talked about it. And all the women talked about times they were traumatized by a man. And then all the men started talking, and they all talked about a time they were traumatized by a man. <laughs> you know, like, there must be testosterone or something. Not that women don't traumatize people, but you get my point. Yeah. And so... That, that stimulated a lot of trauma. And one of my, my women friends or clients who went to the, the march in Washington, um, she liked being at the march, but she was distressed by the amount of vitriol that was coming from some people. The people that were re-stimulated and then their primitive black white selves came up and were relating to the new administration as being evil rather than as having different worldviews, more primitive worldviews than we're used to. And she was distressed by it. Um, it didn't fit with her consciousness, which was more exit green and entrance uh, teal. And so I'm looking at attendees. Anybody have a question? Let me look uh, Q&A. No Q&A yet. Yeah, it looks like uh, we have one person raising their hand. Uh, I'll promote. Yeah, I'll bring them on over for you. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we got a question from Karen. 
All right, Karen, I am, okay. Are you bringing her in? Yeah, I'm bringing her in. Great. Hi there, can you hear me? Hi, Karen, we can yeah, hear you. Karen. Excellent, thank you. I, I really appreciate uh, this time and Dr. Keats, uh, what you're, the, the information you're sharing. My, my question, I actually have two questions. Um, it comes from my background of having followed integral work with Ken for what, 40 years since the 19, early 1980s. Okay. Uh, I've also got a background. I was a career nurse practitioner uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of the lower socioeconomic and tribal clinics um, mm -hmm. and in prisons and jails. Mm -hmm. uh, I also did professional astrology work for um, seven or eight years and uh, followed the Institute of Medic Sciences since the beginning. Uh, and I had what was a real gift, an opportunity to spend six years. I lived six years in a very conservative, small farming community uh, in Northeast Oregon. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was, everybody was Republican, uh, except me, I think. Um, and I've also been, a, I've only, I've never registered a party my whole life. I've always remained an independent politically. My question are two things. Um, these past six months since, since, uh, Trump was elected, and even before that, I started making myself look for and follow what I consider to be the most intelligent uh, right-wing uh, independent news people, journalists, mm -hmm. and also econom economists like um, Catherine Austin Fitz, like uh, Robert David Steele. Uh, they tend to be libertarian, uh, and they, they supported Trump. Mm -hmm. I've made myself follow them and a handful of others. Uh, and of course, I've kept up my usual democracy now and, and you know, the, the far um, left uh, spectrum also. Mm -hmm. It concerns me that, first of all, let me credit Ken with uh, his post-truth world um, uh, document that he wrote. That was the first place I saw the critique of the progressives that I started realizing when I lived in conservative Northeast Oregon. Those were good people. Those were salt of the earth, small family farmers. And I'm sure they all voted for Trump. Right. How, how they saw, they welcomed me, even though I'm sure they regarded me in a lot of the, the ways that uh, Ken describes as far as the, the um, uh, resentment uh, of you know, the, the right wing towards progressives. I, saw, I started seeing, and I hear in the, the perspectives of the right wing, Catherine Austin Fitz, David, uh, Robert Steele, Robert David Steele, and mm -hmm. folks like them, there is a whole layer of very valid criticism of the Democratic Party and Obama, which I saw right out the gate. Mm -hmm. Obama had the opportunity to, to transform the economy uh, in the rubble of what the banksters caused. Instead, he put the same men who caused the implosion in our economy into the top administrative positions. Mm -hmm. I, from the outset, um, certainly he was, he was more eloquent, educated, uh, better role model as a person, but I see that he did severe damage to the world and our country. So the first question I have is, what's it gonna take to get progressives to acknowledge, you know, the real uh, malignant power structure that Obama served and that Clinton would have served and did serve all her life, to recognize this, this um, destructive pyramid uh, that is best described in Foster Gamble's movie, uh, Thrive, What on Earth Will It Take? Mm -hmm. What on earth will it take to have progressives see that we are largely the product of privileges, middle-class privileges, and a very unjust economic system that Obama served well? That's my first question. The okay. second question, and if you want to wait, I can either give you the second one, which is shorter, or you can answer what I just said, your choice. Well, let's, let me answer the first one, okay? Sure. Um, and of course, this isn't an answer. This is, this is you and me in dialectic with okay. each other, right? Okay. Um, so it, it's, it, it, I, I agree. Uh, you know, an awful lot of, of Ken's monograph saying that this is an evolutionary correction, and it's an evolutionary correction partly because of the failures of Green. 
And, you know, I participated in that, um, as did other people, um, maybe not as much as others. Um, and I agree with your uh, critique. Um, you know, I went to my, my brother uh, voted for, for Trump and had a retirement par uh, party. He was a, a judge in a very conservative uh, county in, in California, Kern County. And I went to his retirement party and I was introduced as a liberal brother. Um, and everybody was super nice to me. Um, and I was, and I found them entertaining. I found them charming. And I knew that if I had a flat tire in front of any of their houses, they'd come out and they'd fix my tire and probably offer me dinner. Um, the, the idea of, of dealing with people as people that have basic values that uh, are based in care um, and, the, and the human desires to care for other people and, and share with other people and be fair with other people, I think is really important and has been lost. And it's been lost on green and green's paid for it. So I think that's accurate. And I think that there's a lot of nuances now of green that the whole microaggression thing kind of drives me crazy. I mean, I, I don't think that microaggressions don't exist. I just think making a big deal about them makes green look stupid. And this is the whole point. Uh, Robert Sapolsky wrote a great article about that. The guy wrote why zebras um, don't get ulcers. He said, the difference between someone who wants to have a, a, a microaggression free safe zone and not, is not the same as the difference between um, somebody, uh, a social democrat and a Nazi, uh, uh, somebody who wants a progressive uh, country and um, a Nazi. But to get more to your, your original point, um, my aunt's a federal judge um, and has worked within the system all her life. And she and I had a conversation about this once. And the conclusion we came is that nonviolent change happens very slowly. And also, we have to understand that all that the institutions are not people. Institutions just want to perpetuate themselves and, and grow until there's an external constraint. And so a lot of the co corruption that we see around this is the natural corruption of institutions. Institutions naturally tend towards corruption. And so you don't, you don't have non-corrupt institutions. You have institutions that have mechanisms that, are, that help self-correct and minimize corruption. Like I'm not so pissed off at the banks and the insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies anymore. I see them as underregulated. If we say, you know, you guys can do what you have to do, you got to serve us 10 times better and make 10% profit, and we constrain them that way, they'd serve us 10 times better and they'd make their 10% profit. And so what do I have to do? Well, operate on a very grassroots level, it's very much like the Republicans did when they took over all those state houses, and gradually create a consensus however long it takes until we can vote people in the power who can create the kind of constraints that will put the constraints on government agencies, perhaps, on financial institutions, on the banks, and so on. Kind of like Canada has. Canada has had zero bank crises in the last 100 years, and we've had 17. Why? They have well-regulated banks. It's not like their banks are more moral than ours. Um, they're just more regulated by the collective there. And that's true in other countries also. Rabobank, for instance, it's from my, it's Northern Europe, I think, Denmark. They didn't fall during the crash. Um, they had an interior regulation that they weren't going to go with junk bonds and so on. So uh, I see corruption happening. Um, I, and I see it as, a, as there's, there's evil people involved in it, but also there's a lot of good people that work in institutions that have corruption. And if it's a huge institution, you know, they're going to be serving that corruption um, until the institution is regulated. And there's just countless countless examples of sugar industry, tobacco industry, you know, the, the food industry, on and on and on. And so what do we do? We encourage dialogue. What do we do? Uh, we work on, on local levels and, and communication levels. What do we do? We find common cause. I mean, this is why everybody loved infra infrastructure, because a lot of that infrastructure is going to go to red rural areas. And the infrastructure isn't just going to build stuff. It's going to uh, blend people together. Um, you know, if the Democratic Party said we want to create Democratic missionaries who go and create little pockets in red rural areas where they just give away health care and, 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 and education and tutoring your kids and helping you negotiate stuff, you know, if they did that, they probably have the same success that the Catholic Church had when it took over the world um, uh, during the uh, 15th century. And so, you know, now I, don't, I, don't, I think that that's a process that's happening. I think the progressives always win eventually. But, you know, entrenched interests will always create corruption. And right now, they got their guy in charge, and he's going to make it better for them. 
just like Bush did when he gave, did those massive uh, tax cuts uh, to the wealthy. Now, was that evil? It wasn't evil. Was it wrong from a social standpoint? Yeah. I mean, if you look at all four quadrants, that's not good for anybody. That's not good for the country, and it's not good for business. What's good for business is a big middle class. You know, and that happened in the 50s in the United States when the middle class was invested in. But, you know, we had a government that was working in, in synchrony and inevitably um, people in power want to give themselves advantage. And so over time, there's this ongoing process in a democracy of corruption rising and then needing to be regulated is by some kind of populist upright, uh, uprising, which is what Trump voters really wanted to do. They thought that they were cleaning the swamp. They thought that they were adjusting the corruption. They, you know, they drank the Kool-Aid and instead furthered it. And so what's the alternative? Well, you know, it is, in, in my opinion, the best alternative is to support education on every level. Um, the more we provide early childhood education, the more we support pregnant mothers and families, the more we provide free college, at, that kind of stuff. Development then takes its own course. You know, we have more people thinking, thinking better. We have more people having capacity for critical thinking. We have more people who are interested in the world. Um, I think ultimately that eliminating abuse of children and creating enrichment for children is, is really one of the main answers, but it's a wicked problem because there's so many forces that affect that. And yeah, so and that's my part of this conversation, Karen. Th thank you very much. I'll just uh, respond to two things. One is that the, the right uh, independent news that I consider intelligent are all in agreement about massive um, child abuse, pedophilia uh, rings that are very much a part of the, the government bureaucracy. Okay. Well, yeah, that's, I understand. And you know, did you ever read the Ring Trilogy, the Tolkien Trilogy, ever? Uh, a lot of people have read it. Um, oh, I haven't, no. Okay, well, you know, there's a study called the ACE study that found out that, that, that most people had some kind of traumatic event of their life and that 26% of women, 18% of, uh, of men were sexually abused in some fashion. In other words, there, yes, trauma is, is rampant. Neglect is rampant in this country um, and it has huge impacts. There's, the research is, is incontrovertible about that. Now, of course, what happens when you're in, when you're dealing with value means that don't, don't use all four quadrants, then they're vulnerable to, to false facts. They're vulnerable to the big lie. They're vulnerable to that kind of stuff. And that's going to happen. And people will use that to manipulate them into, into voting, manipulate them into different positions. And that's going to always happen with those value means. And, so, and since we all have to grow through different stages, what I want to do is support the spiral and people go over against child abuse and there's these government rings who go, okay, well, I don't want to talk about the government rings so they don't agree with that, but I really want to talk with you about child abuse and child sexual abuse and let's stop it. And, and there's ways of stopping it with education and there's ways of stopping it with um, intervention and there's ways of stopping it with providing resources to young families and we can do it in your county and in your city and in your, and, and in your school. Let's do that. Let's make that happen. And I can yeah. find common cause with that. And I want to find common cause with that. Um, yeah, OK, good. Good example. And the other, I, I just want to uh, address the regulation in a way that my, my Marxist brother does. He says, no, the, the, the big corporate uh, industries are not unregulated. They're regulated in favor of their own interest and the wealthy. Well, that's what I mean by <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They, they are regulated. regulated. <laughs> Underregulated. <laughs> And I want to apologize for my dark screen. I have a, a camera that's nestled underneath my, my uh, nesting station here. Um, oh, no. My other quick question is, in trying to communicate the value of an integral work, working framework to address what we're going through right now, amongst you know, educated, middle class, uh, especially I've been looking to the faith communities because they're doing such good work uh, for justice and nonviolent responses to the uh, tragedy we're, uh, we're seeing, there, there, it's like it falls, I don't understand why I can't evoke uh, some interest or find like-minded people that, that 
appreciate the value of the integral perspective. You know, what's up with that? Is it just where I live or what? Karen, it is not just where you live. And you can see the expression on my face. You know, I've had conversations, even arguments with Ken about this. You know, when I wrote my shadow book, I was writing from integral rather than about integral because I had never had any success getting people excited about integral. And I was too subtle about it, you know, so Ken said, you don't have structure stages in here. I said, yes, I do on page 199 at 277 at 350 and so on. And, was, and we had to talk about how do you transmit this? And you can't just teach people aqua because people go and think, find it's just so much blah, blah. And I used to say that, you know, that was more true for women than for men, but the, the head of uh, integral coaching in Canada told me that that was a bullshit position. And he said, you know, he's found equal people clueless and equal people excited with men and women. So anyway, I'm not going to say that anymore because I think he's probably right. So to answer your question, there are certain basic core aspects of integral that I talk about with my clients and with other people. And I don't try teaching people aqua anymore. I don't try directing people to Ken's writings. You got to be a particular kind of person to read Ken's writings. And some people love them and the rest of the people find them um, obscure. Um, and so what are the things that we look for? Well, okay, the dialectic, okay? You know, non-exclusion, uh, uh, non enfoldment and action. You know, basically, what is that practically? Practically, that's saying, all right, Let's look for what we both agree on. Okay, let's. Another practical one is taking a stand for progressive religion, progressive Catholicism. Then, you know, there was a recent article, I think I read it today. Pope Francis had therapy when he was 42 years old. Okay, he's a psychoanalysis with a Jewish woman. <laughs> she tickles me, you know, and he says, it really helped me. So, a lot of women over the years have really helped me work some things out and so on. And in the same interview, he said, I have a problem with people who are rigid thinkers. He said, they're fundamentalists and that's not good. Okay, this is the Pope saying that he doesn't believe in fundamentalists. Okay, this is a perfect opportunity for me when I'm working with a Catholic client and is to talk about structure stages. I go, yeah, yeah, you know, he's, he's kind of a pluralistic and integral uh, Catholic, just like Thomas Keaton is. I go, what does that mean? I go, well, you know, you go from egocentric to, to believing it just because they tell you to wanting to have rational explanations for it, to wanting everybody to be equal, but knowing secretly that they're not. To going to a place where you go, well, you know, there's a lot of relativistic truth and there's basic fundamental principles in this religion that I love that drive me crazy with, with love when I think about it. And that's progressive Catholicism. And what happened with my Catholic client when we went through this a number of times, he looked at me and said, Keith, you're a better Catholic than most of the Catholic side. <laughs> okay, so that's what we do. We find some aspect of it that is relevant to the moment, and then we advocate for it. And sometimes it's structure stages. Sometimes it's a dialectic instead of argument. Sometimes it's inclusion rather than exclusion and enfoldment. Um, sometimes it's looking at the quadrants, but you don't have to call them the quadrants. You go, well, you know, science says, you know, we can observe the, all the architecture of love, for instance. We can look at the, the, someone falling in love and we can see the nucleus acumen pumping out dopamine and we can see the frontal cortex having the, the mini serotonin. And we can see all that stuff, but we, we, that really doesn't in, catch the quality of love, does it? <laughs> so there's two things. There's that qualitative interior thing and then there's the exterior looking at it from the outside. Everything's like that. And then someone will go, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's really true. And then that sets the stage for talking about upper left quadrant developmental stages um, and worldviews. Um, and structure stages are a really big deal. If structure stages were taught when people were seven or eight, when they're just absorbing information, and then they rediscovered it when they had critical thinking at 13 and 14, that would change the culture. And Ken and I talked about this. If, if people could have a mindfulness some form of mindfulness in elementary school and learn structure stages in elementary school, uh, potentially that would have a huge impact. But like all these problems, it's a wicked problem. And it's an ongoing problem in the inter-world community. We've all talked about it. We've all debated it. We've all had certain experiences with it. And we've all experimented with it like I did speaking from integral in my last two books rather than about integral. And we've now, none of us come up with a solution that is completely satisfying 
but we need to keep the conversation going. Well, I'm smiling. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I'm smiling too, Karen. Thank you. Okay. Somebody else, anybody else want to ask a question or read what you, anybody write anything in? Still got a few minutes. We've got time for a little bit more before we have to stop. Yeah, if anyone else has a question, you can just raise your hand and we will bring you over as a panelist. Okay, something's flashing here, but I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> no, it looks like no one has raised their hands yet. Um, the chat box lit up. Ah. Chat box lit up. Okay, what does that mean? Yeah, so it looks like we have a we have a question from uh, Nina, which uh, I suppose I'll just read, Keith. Sure. Uh, Nina asks, "Do you think heart math techniques could help heal attachment issues?" Absolutely. Um, to those of you that are familiar with the Heart Math Institute, the Heart Math Institute um, was started a number of years ago by Doc Children. Um, wanting to um, help heal people through states practices. And basically, they um, uh, pulled on the research of um, uh, um, uh, um, Dan Pro Daniel Por uh, Porges, Steve Porges, and others, that it, the more um, uh, heart rate variability you have and the more coherence of heartbeat you have, um, generally, the calmer you are, the calmer you are, the more socially engaged you stay. And you, you are, and you stay out of those defensive states I talked about earlier, and you stay more in the states of healthy response. And they developed very simple techniques for enhancing heart rate variability. And I described one of them, and we can all do it right now. It's everybody think about somebody that um, you care about and feel grateful for them in your heart until you feel the the quality of gratitude, the, the subjective upper left quality of gratitude in your chest. Okay, just feel that. And sustain it for about 10 seconds, feeling grateful for this person that you love. So if you did this, one second. So if you did this five times a day for the next two weeks, you'd get pretty good at generating a sense of gratitude. And you can do it with love, you can do it with joy, you can do it with forgiveness and so on. And this is really good for your body. Um, so then after a couple of weeks, you start sustaining that feeling for a couple of minutes, two or three minutes. And after a couple more weeks, you start noticing when you're not grateful and generate gratitude. Um, um, you start noticing when you're upset and then you do this exercise before you start try, trying to solve the problem. And this is, this is a few of the many, many, many techniques that the heart math people have done. And they have uh, devices, one of which I used in my meditation practice for a couple of years that, you know, it has a red light, a blue light, and a green light. It's great for meditation because as soon as the green light goes on, you, you get this egoic satisfaction that you got a green light and you go back to the red light. So it's really good for meditating. So the, the question is, would this heal? And yes, it, it will heal trauma. And the answer to that is yes. Okay. Um, now, Mostly with trauma, you don't want to just try to heal it by yourself. You want to heal it with yourself and with other people. But the way you use hard math techniques for trauma is if there's a traumatic memory that you have, you know, say of an assault. Okay. Okay. I think of an assault. I'm trying to remember a time. There's a time some people tried to, uh, try to think of personal. Okay. I've got a personal traumatic memory. You know, my mother was hitting me when I was a kid. Okay. So I think about that, that memory and I feel my, my distress go up. All right, okay, so I feel it go up for a few seconds and then I do my heart math exercise. I focus on gratitude. In this case, gratitude for a mother who continued to grow as a person and became an enlightened woman at 90 and uh, someone I admire um, with psychotherapy and, and sobriety and a, a wide variety of other things that she engaged in in intimate dialogue um, with many wise people. Okay, so now I think about that episode again. I feel my distress rising. I stop and do a little bit of heart math. Okay. And I go back and forth, pendulating between soothing myself, feeling the distress, soothing myself, feeling the distress. Yeah, over time, if I do that, um, that traumatic event will begin to be processed by that information processing uh, system, the adaptive information processing system in my brain that I was just describing, by that dual focus exercise. 
And I'll feel less distressed when I remember that event. And I don't feel very distressed now because I've worked on that event extensively in my life. And it's just not that distressing to me anymore. So that is one way of using the heart math material uh, to deal with trauma. That being said, um, it's always good to have someone that loves you and that, you're tr and that you trust to talk about with trauma. It can be a, a friend, it can be a minister, it can be a therapist, and so on. And the reason for this is that many of us feel ashamed of our trauma. Most people that were abused, sexually abused, or physically abused, or emotionally abused as kids, when they were kids, the way they made sense of it is they felt responsible and ashamed. Okay, well, you know, that works its way into our personality structure. And so that shame, shame makes us want to hide. It's one of the reasons I wrote my book, The Gift of Shame. I don't think people understand shame well enough as a developmental driver. Um, it's a necessary emotion, but it, just like anger, it's a dangerous emotion. And so one great way of dealing with that is finding someone that you, you respect and you care about, you love, and talk about what you're ashamed about. And you look in their eyes and you're not going to see them dismissing you or being disgusted with you or giving you a hard time. You're going to see them loving you and being compassionate. And that'll challenge that shame. You go, okay, so what is that shame about? My shame says that I violated some value. What value did I value? I, I guess the value I violated is I was supposed to stop that person from abusing me. That's what I was supposed to do. And I made a mistake by not doing it. Well, that's a crazy value. It's a better value. Better value is that's the solution that I came at that time. And I, that it must be my responsibility. That's how I made sense of it at four years old. And now I'm still making sense of it in the same way. And I want to make sense of it in a better way now. Okay. And you can feel my voice. You can feel the love in my heart as I talk. Okay. And so you, you get that with another person. So you want to do that too. So you can use the heart math, but you also want to do it with another person. And that's why, you know, that, now one of the dangers of this, of course, on a larger scale is echo chambers. And Karen was talking about that around, you know, pathologizing other people who disagree with us. But, you know, we need containers where we feel absolutely safe in certain situations, in our family, in our relationship in our community, our sangha, and especially if we're working on stuff like this. And so there you go. Well, we've reached about the end of our hour here. I want to thank everybody for being on. Isn't anybody have one la any last question, any last anything before we uh, stop? I didn't see the last question in my box, but um, anybody else? Uh, Nina says thank you. Okay, well, you're welcome, Nina. Okay, so before we stop, I want to promote some stuff. Oh, oh, hey, hey, Keith. Uh, we actually looks like one person is raising their hand. Do you have time for one more question? I sure do, Barbara. Barbara All right. Let me put you online. Yeah, I'm bringing her over now, Keith. Okay, good. And hi, Barbara. Let's unmute her. Okay, Barbara, you are now unmuted. You are live. Well, I see the mute on her. No, there it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My question has to do with this thing that you, that in the write-up about today, uh -huh. I loved it about how, um, how you can, uh, here's what, I'll give you something concrete. I can feel a certain way and then get near someone and I'm very, very sensitive. And so what happens is I feel it, it shifts. I allow it to shift me because yeah. I'm, so, so I'm feeling it. And it's not that I get defensive, but I could get, I, I, it, it gets confusing and something, the thing that, um, and I might get defensive internally, but I probably wouldn't say anything, but I could, and then I just feel what it feels like in my body. But however, I, this happens with my husband as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to, I want you to talk a little bit more if you could about how that happens. Just, just looking at somebody or something, I mean, seriously. Well, yes. And also this is going to be, the, the focus of an entire episode in the future. So I'm going to give you the short answer, but we're going to, I'm going to spend a whole hour talking about this because this is such a big deal and so important. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, I want everybody to know that 20% of people are born highly sensitive emotionally. Okay. I'm one of those people. Barbara, maybe you're one of those people. I am. Okay. And that being said, all humans are incredibly sensitive to each other. We're connected energetically. We're connected via mirror nuance, neuron systems. Like Barbara, you and I are looking at each other in the screen now, and our mirror neuron systems are recapitulating our states of consciousness, including our intentionality. And this happens, of course, in marriages. And, it, and you know, about 30% of my practice over the years, so after 60,000 sessions, I guess that's you know, 20, 25,000 sessions with couples. 
couples need to, need to harness this to love each other better. And how do you do that? You recognize how incredibly sensitive you are to each other and what you want going towards the other person. The, the principle is I want yes going towards you all the time. And I want you are safe going towards you all the time. Now, if you stop feeling safe and I notice it and I'm your husband, I notice it and I go, oh, I'm sorry. And then I try to make it safe. And if you're attuned to me and you're not that kind of caught up in an angry response to whatever I just did, you feel my shift and you feel gratitude. And then I see your gratitude and we're attuned again. And so we find each other and lose each other and find each other and lose each other. And we understand that the contract of our life with each other is we're always looking to find each other and we find each other when we look at each other with approval and love, which of course recapitulates mothers and infants. Mothers and infants are miscoordinated energetically 70% of the time, but the mother looks at the child, notices it, finds the child psychologically, emotionally, the child feels fine, the inner subjectivity is returned. And so we want to get better at that every day as a married couple. And if we're not getting better at it with each other, we want to kind of put effort. And if we can't make progress by ourselves, we find some therapist to help us so that, so we can use that sensitivity to feel more deeply loving and loved and more grateful for each other. So that's the short answer. That's a lovely answer. And I felt it in my heart. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for uh, joining us. So before we stop, I want to tell everybody about some things. Okay. So first of all, the what now conference is happening December 29th to January 1st. I'm going to be speaking there. Ken's going to be speaking there. A lot of great people are there. We're going to have a lot of fun. And the first 150 people that sign up save $600 on this. So, you know, sign up, you know, in, in, as soon as possible and save $600 and, you know, join us for those three days. Also, um, uh, you can find more about my material in my website, drkeithwitt.com. Um, my new uh, workbook, the Shadow Light workbook, just came out last week. It's a companion volume for Shadow Light for people who wanted to focus in on the transformational practices that I included in the Shadow Light. Um, I concentrated them in the Shadow Light workbook um, so that there were a series of practices over the different chapters. Also, um, I'm except people can email me about this and I'll put you on a list. Um, I'm going to be starting a training program for ther experienced therapists in February and I'm going to be accepting applications in October. These are for people that have had five to 10,000 or more hours of service. And I want to get together a, a group of eight to 18 therapists for nine months. We'll have a three a day together in Santa Barbara um, session. We'll, the beginning and a third day, three day at the end and then meet weekly uh, via Zoom like this. And I want to create a container that will um, encourage horizontal and vertical growth with the goal of the therapist at the end to be able to have to be stable at turquoise and teal in their sessions and to clarify their natural healing style to the extent that they could become founders in that style if they want. I'm very excited about this. I'm just getting the website together and everything, but I want to let everybody know if you're interested, email me on my website and I'll put you on the, the list and I'll email you when I'm sending out um, the applications and when the website up, the website's up. Now, the other thing is that if you want to have access to these, um, to this uh, call and to other calls, join the Integral Life. Um, and when you do, you get an infinity of stuff. You get all Ken's stuff, which is, there's infinity right there. And then you get a lot of stuff from me and other contributors, you know, and fellow travelers in the evolution of consciousness. And uh, I encourage everybody to do it if you're not already a member. It's certainly been one of the joys of my life to be a member of Wonderful Life. So anyway, there you go. Talk to everybody, uh, hopefully, uh, the first Saturday of next month. And thank you all for joining us in my life. Thank you, Keith. That was great.